good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming by this talk. How to start a cyber war, lessons from Brussels. Um, I had a lot of fun building this talk, and hopefully it works great, because I had to convert some stuff to some slides, because I had a horrible laptop on this trip. So, who am I? Uh, I've got a background in cyber warfare. I've handled several uh, very high-end cyber warfare incidents, all the way back to uh, things that I did in the military with Space Command and the U.S. Air Force, and also as a civilian handling part of the many cyber warfare events between North and South Korea. Um, so these types of things happen. Um, my background and expertise is actually for critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure on oil and gas, uh, energy production, transmission, and water and nuclear. So I, I have a lot of fun with that. Uh, my previous position, I headed uh, security across the EMEA and South American operations for the Saudi Aramco family for all of security, information protection, and intelligence. So this talk is about the European Union and NATO cyber warfare exercises held in Brussels with all member states. And we also invited non-members as well to uh, come and join us uh, from different European nations. And we have a lot of very unique threats in Russia, or excuse me, in Europe. Oh, we're not Russian yet. Um, I hope we don't. Oh my god. <laughs> um, but we've got a lot of very unique challenges in Europe right now because there's the rise of populism. Uh, we've got a lot of Russian influence that is coming not only in Eastern Europe, but also popping up into places like Austria. Uh, and uh, so we're having a lot of fun with, with, with Putin and, and all sorts of things. But uh, at the same time, we also are in a position with the European Union that we do not understand right now our relationship with the United States. Right? So a few days ago, early, earlier this week, uh, the Congress sent up uh, their ideas of basically, hey, we believe that we will support NATO in case a NATO ally comes under attack, whether it be physical or cyber warfare. And so that, that was very nice for us Europeans, but we'd like to see it happen. Well, actually, we don't want to see the whole cyber warfare thing happen, but if it does, we would very much like the US's help. So we have a lot of issues that are going on, just like any member bloc or large country would. Now, what these exercises wanted to do was bring to the forefront the actual real threats to the ministers of defense of NATO member nations or European nations. Uh, secretaries of state, and so forth. Now, there is no actual definition of cyber warfare yet that is internationally accepted. So we brought them together and built three major scenarios, all built on real world stuff. And we also uh, built out with the European Council on Foreign Relations a diplomatic toolkit of decisions and things that they could make because there are no operational playbooks for cyber warfare yet for different countries. So I wanted to give them some knowledge and tools for that. Questions will be at the end, sir. So one of the things I did, I opened up the exercises by warming them up, showing them some real world things. And one of the things that I was able to show them was, this is a power plant which is infected with a particular type of rat. This rat, remote access Trojan, was actually being controlled behind Vimple ISP in Russia. Uh, we found the same exact rat in a uh, salmon farm hitting agriculture in another EU country. Same exact version, same exact location that was controlling it. And this is problematic because, why? Well, I, I kind of like food and electricity and water. And uh, nowadays, we've got a lot of uh, economies that are driven on agriculture. So here in California, agriculture is huge. This is an IoT grow system. And by the way, yes, if you grow weed and you connect it to the internet, you might be able to find it. Um, right? But it is the basis of a lot of tax revenue in the United States right now. Think of Colorado. 
All right, so if somebody wanted to affect your revenue and your economic status, where would they go? So if you're making money off of that, hey, hey a foreign entity might try to smoke up, right? So <clears throat> I also wanted to add to them that uh, their particular positions, the people that were in the audience and types of uh, technology that they use, that they also ran a very high likelihood of their particular smartphones, even government issued and locked down, as having some sort of surveillance wear. And I did this for two reasons, to bring it straight home, and also I figured out where each one of them kept their phones because the moment that I said that, they went to touch wherever their phone was to make sure. So we started with three main scenarios. The first one was a, a very interesting one where there was an embassy employee that brought some work home. Uh, the second one was getting more in depth about using different tools back and forth and then dead canary, you can kind of get from the title where it goes to from there. Now, the decisions that our diplomats and ministers of foreign affairs had were things like, you can do nothing. You can pretend that it doesn't exist. You could publicly say, hey, they shouldn't be hacking us and put it in, in papers, right? You could say, hey, we're calling all of our diplomats home and we're kicking your people out. We've all heard those news stories, we've read them, we've seen them. And these are different types of tools that various diplomats have to try to put pressure. Um, you could try to join together uh, with solidarity. Uh, the Netherlands is the only country in the world that according to them legally can hack back on any device anywhere in the world. And so they have the legal power to hack anything, including this laptop. Uh, they could declare full on war and then, of course, some of the member states and NATO members are nuclear powers. So we're now starting to get to the point where uh, software vulnerabilities and exploits could cause a nuclear war. And that's one of the reasons why this uh, series of exercises were so important to discuss. So if we look at Clean Slate, we have a burnt out embassy employee who is suffering some mental illness has a high security clearance and starts bringing back information home and hoarding paperwork. Uh, the, uh, one of his adult children lives with him and she assumes that the paperwork must be unclassified because it's at the private home. So in the scenario, she happens to belong to 4chan and Reddit and starts posting up things to get karma and then it's quickly realized when a foreign entity sees confidential secret information, they start grabbing it. In the meantime, before the particular embassy is alerted to it, uh, her personal laptop is infected by just regular old malware and they grab a copy of it and then those particular just regular cyber criminals go ahead and start posting it on the dark web for sale. Now, once you put something on the internet, how hard is it to get off the internet, right? Now, Little Man was a bit interesting because it involves uh, a little bit more people like us, right? I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a head of state. So a security researcher finds a vulnerability, builds proof of concept code, and then tries to alert uh, their country's computer emergency response team. In Europe, each country runs their own computer emergency response team. It isn't like DHS CERT, where they can scan Alaska or they can scan Florida. Uh, obviously, I don't think that uh, the Netherlands would appreciate it if Germany was starting to scan us, right? So uh, this security researcher, the CERT was not an actual mature CERT. So the researcher gets friends, tries to find another cert that they can send the uh, exploit information to. Unfortunately, the communications for part of it is not encrypted. And so the other country cert gets the proof of concept code. And so does a foreign entity who has obviously been surveilling a cert mailbox to uh, see what they can find, any sort of clear text, because once you route things around the internet, it's not directly for me to you. It's going all over the place. 
And if any part of it is clear text, somebody can sniff that up and get that information. So this, unfortunately, put a very powerful uh, exploit into the wrong hands. Now, to complicate matters further, because the only country in the world that can hack back is the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands is doing an investigation, and they mistakenly hit uh, a Chinese consulate. Whoops, yes, didn't mean to hack into your consulate server there. Uh, yeah, because I've gotten an IP address wrong. Has anyone else gotten an IP address wrong or a file location wrong? It's pretty easy to do. Uh, in the meantime, there comes up this group, the Shadow Brokers, and they have a subscription service. Now, you also have to decide, you as a country, do you go ahead and buy that subscription because you know that other countries have? Shouldn't you have the same advantage that they do? So these were decisions that uh, we allowed them to make, and it was very entertaining. On the final day, um, it was a full day event, and it is Dead Canary. In this particular scenario, there were five European Union and NATO members which come under devastating cyber warfare attacks. It begins on July 17th. One particular country's national banking system is taken down and wiped out. Their telecommunications infrastructure is also deeply affected. Government websites are DDoSed. People, the population, do not know what's going on. They cannot get money from their banks. They cannot call a friend. They cannot call or contact anyone. The internet is starting to go down. There is no more Facebook. Of course, this has a psychological effect on a population, right? Then, the very next morning, uh, I can say which country this was, uh, and, uh, an attacker group gets into the port of Rotterdam, the Netherlands, which is one of the largest ports in the world. It's actually the most technologically advanced. It's mostly robotic. And they close some of the lock systems, causing, or actually capsizing, a container ship. And all of the sailors are missing. A few bodies are pulled out. Not too long after, another country is attacked. They go after a lot of the electricity transformers and start a series of transformer fires, which a domino effect occurs and then also causes uh, an imbalance in the electricity production throughout Europe because we're tied to a grid together with each other. And things have to be harmonious or you'll get too much of one thing or another. You might fry things or you might have a sump and not get enough electricity. So that's a problem because it currently takes anywhere from six months to 18 months to manufacture a large transformer. And if a country has been cut out because a bunch of their transformers have been taken out, it's going to be a little while before they're going to be able to recover. On top of that, uh, trying to put out all of the different fires all over the place, right? You're from California. You're, or you're at least in California, and there were a big series of fires which they think may have been started by poor maintenance from PG&E. So then, 8.45, the same morning, the attackers then attack the signaling system for the London Underground, and they make trains smash into each other during rush hour in London. Shortly after, one of the major stock exchanges in another country, their stock exchange is taken out. They actually have to halt all of the trading, which then causes markets to panic around the world. What we prepared for uh, was that the United States would not assist us. And the letter went like this. Pretend I'm Donald Trump. Good morning, America. We have discovered that five of our European allies have come under devastating cyber warfare attacks, leading to mass casualties. Now, when I last visited the new NATO headquarters in Brussels, I told them, no, I warned them, that if they did not get their 
defense spending up to 2% of GDP, uh, now is the time for Europe to stand on its own two feet. American blood will not be spilled. God bless and God bless America. So to give you a bit of background, uh, one of our bones of contention with the United States right now is the fact that after 9-11, Article 5 for NATO was called because the United States came under attack. And so other NATO, NATO allies started giving lots of intelligence information, sending boats to help with the Coast Guard, many different things. But what would happen if things were reversed? <clears throat> so we also tried to style it with a realistic attack. How many of you have heard of the Shamoon attacks from Saudi Arabia? All right, so Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco, about 25% of the world's energy goes through them every day. They're the world's most valuable company. Apple pales in comparison. They were definitely not the first trillion dollar company. Uh, Aramco was, most definitely. And uh, they believe that the country of Iran uh, went ahead and attacked Saudi Aramco using European servers, uh, went ahead and destroyed about 85% of the Windows-based systems, and that was anything that was connected to Windows. Over 30,000 computer systems were wiped out. And what happened was the world's largest company went dark, and they disconnected themselves from the Internet. And uh, that does not do well for world markets. What we estimated was if the attack had been successful, a barrel of oil would be $400 to $450 a barrel. So that's just one company. And that's one of the reasons why we styled it off of this. Now, off of the Ramco network used to be that fire stations, police stations, and so forth were hanging off of it because they had a lot of the telecommunications infrastructure for the country. So if you t attack them, you took out a whole bunch of different things around the country, basically halting them. So in Europe and in the UK, because we don't have uh, an EU cert that helps out and scans different countries, they're just a, an information repository. Each country is responsible to do it themselves. And I'll give a good example. I love Bulgaria, but the Bulgarian cert Computer Emergency Response Team doesn't even use a, an encryption certificate on their website. So not every country it has 100% capabilities. And because we hormone, harmonize all of our electricity across the EU countries, one weak link could affect the rest of Europe. And so that's another one of our concerns. So what we're seeing here is this is part of a train system that I could operate remotely and press buttons. You don't want me to do that. I don't know how to drive a train. Uh, electricity, and these are um, over here exposure in the United Kingdom of, uh, there's a particular protocol for industrial control systems called Modbus. And Modbus will take a command from anywhere with no authentication. Luckily Modbus is not uh, on like TCP IP, you need some, a bit of translation in between to do it. But, uh, there are a lot of these different types of protocols that are out there, and you really don't want them exposed. So some of the lessons learned, and this was actually part of the one thing that kind of uh, scared me, was there no one altogether, none of them could come up with a consensus. So we not only do not have a definition of cyber warfare, but here we're showing real scenarios, and they could not make a decision together to say yes or no. Now, when we broke them up into teams, they were able to do that on, on a smaller level, but if it's something that's affecting all of Europe or NATO, we need them to be able to come to a consensus. Um, another thing was preparation. A lot of them did not have very much preparation or did not realize what the domino effect might be across the board. So, uh, and one, I gotta say, one country, the only answer was sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. And then when I would ask her, I go, so what's your decision? Let me guess, sanctions. And she's like, yes, sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. 
well, that doesn't always work because when you put sanctions on a country, you then have to set up an apparatus to watch and see if the uh, sanctions are actually functioning, right? Um, come on, you can move. It froze. Oh, there we go. That's okay. Uh, present. So um, this this slide, I, I actually had to change uh, because I got a very interesting call last evening. Um, so in real life, we also have countries that are sanctioned and they want to fund the regime, so they find creative ways to do it. So they might use malware. They might use ransomware. They might use uh, different types of cyber criminal activity to funnel dark money into a way that sanctions cannot find. And this is very dangerous. And in this particular scenario, um, a particular sanctioned country attempted to recruit me and pay me a lot of money to come in and teach them offensive hands-on security with a focus on critical infrastructure and breaking it. And that's why I had to change the slide because there's now a big investigation started. Um, another thing that is a big concern now is the different types of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So since we had the exercises, I've also joined up with the all-party parliamentary group on artificial intelligence at the House of Lords uh, in Parliament in London. And the European Union asked me to uh, lend some of my expertise on how some of these different things uh, have already been used in intelligence and military applications, because one of my specialties is also machine learning and natural language processing with correlation. And as algorithms began to write algorithms, which by the way, they're, they're not audible, or uh, auditable, sorry. Uh, I am a bit jet lagged, that's, that's gonna be my excuse. Uh, so we cannot even audit these algorithms yet. And we're already using them to uh, pick out, yeah, I, I, I think that that person meets the requirements to drone them. They're wearing a Casio watch. They go to a lot of airports. Uh, there are different parameters that are put into these algorithms. And we're seeing it more and more. So this is a picture of the auto loading system for refined gasoline in Saudi Arabia. And 13 days after the initial attack from the Shemun attacks, uh, the payment system and the intermediary systems to load these trucks were unavailable. So how many days do you think the United States has for a strategic oil supply? I don't know, that's probably a national security matter. But, correct, probably. So when you start running out of gasoline, let's say you need an ambulance. Well, we'd love to come to you, but we can't. At this point in time, people could not get gasoline. Uh, they were camping out at gasoline stations because where else would you go. Saudi Arabia provides the refined uh, oil products, petroleum products to Bahrain. Bahrain was starting to get cut off. And then one day after this, Qatar was attacked with the same malware, Shmoon. Except there was a major difference, by the way. The Saudi Aramco version had a burning American flag. The Qatar one did not. Now, Qatar provides about 14% of the world's energy. And in a two-week time period, the world was facing privately about, you know, almost 40% of the energy supply was about to be cut out. So we know that these things are going on. We know that uh, they have happened. They will happen. We know that uh, many times it takes friends. Do you know who your friends are at any given moment? Because that's one of our problems in Europe right now is we're unsure about our friendship in various ways. And making uh, assumptions that uh, someone else will take care of, of security or we'll just assume that the systems will be okay, that doesn't work. Assumptions, unfortunately, are starting to kill people now. So we can't move backwards, we need to move forward. And one of the things we did stress was absolutely we need to plan now because even if there is uh, another problem that it isn't used for cyber warfare, but let's say a major vendor like Siemens rolls out, although they don't have this capability right now, but uh, we're able to roll out a bunch of very bad updates 
to a bunch of systems, because this is where they're trying to go forward with, you know, being able to secure their systems, um, bad things could happen. Or if there's a major company that's taken out, like General Electric, think about the effects. So we're planning on these types of things, because unfortunately, now technology can kill people. So I've tried to leave a lot of room and time for questions. Uh, if you would like to find out more about the Shamoon attacks, uh, Dark Net Diaries has just released episode 30, uh, which is an in-depth interview uh, with myself on what the attacks were like and the ongoing Shamoon 2 and 3 versions as well, which are still ongoing. They're still getting hammered. And well, that's it. I tried to leave plenty of time. So I know you had looked like you had a question, two questions. So your assertion that there's no definition for cyber war ignores the Talon manual. Is that on purpose? Um, well, the Talon manual is, is a bit different. There's no international consensus uh, for what the definition is. That's NATO. That's not an international consensus where everybody agrees. That's only NATO members. And that's only the European Union. And they also do not have a consensus because not every member of the EU is a member of NATO. So there, there's no internationally agreed upon definition of cyber warfare. The UN actually tried a year and a half ago, but uh, amongst the committee, one particular country, I am not allowed to say which, decided to drop out of the negotiations to come up with that uh, definition at the last moment. Could be, could be, yeah, could be. In your experience, uh, how would you describe China as a potential actor in a cyber war of the future? Well, one of the things that's very interesting about China is uh, the idea that uh, it's a given that you should leverage any information that you have. Uh, in the Chinese culture, it's, it's different from many Western cultures. So the symbol for China is a box with a line because it indicates that that is the center of the world that China is. And that is the way that the culture has been for thousands of years. And if you are at negotiations with a delegation, they will do their due diligence and look you up and find out information about you. Well, many Europeans think, my gosh, that's very rude. I shouldn't Google somebody, not in the slightest. But that's not how the Chinese operate. It's just a different culture. I would look people up. And I'm not Chinese. But there is a clash with that. There's another clash with, uh, for example, how uh, the Chinese government has obtained or uses uh, information to feed into various machine learning. So they say, hey, this might be a data dump that's been stolen, but it's available for us to go ahead and use. Well, a European country will be like, no, it's stolen. We couldn't possibly feed it in to do anything. So there's also a big difference between the two as well in that respect. So I, I think that um, they're very capable. And uh, like any other nation, they've been around for a while. They should be capable. Right? It's part of their national defense, just like the United States. So I would be concerned. Oh, one sec. Do you think um, cyber war during formal warfare would look any different than the low-grade cyber war that goes on every day? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, probably. Um, the way that it would be executed. So uh, about six months before any Russian boots were seen in the Crimea region, a particular security researcher out of the Ukraine noted that only in the Crimea region, a whole bunch of smart TV systems, which had been put on sale uh, the Christmas before, um, were being controlled by someone else and the channels would be switched to propaganda pro-Russian stuff six months before Russian boots were in Crimea. And so they were already trying to tell that on only that population in Crimea to get support. So um, there are similarities, but things will be done in their own unique ways because of this uh, type of cyber domain. 
or new domain, I should say. A question about U.S. response to cyber terrorism from state actors. Um, under Obama, at least I recall reading about discussions um, with the cyber, not quite the cyber evangelist, but the person who was in ch charge that Obama had appointed, and of course he was let go by the Donald. And I haven't heard of anything happening under Donald, so the question is, where are we positioned? Well, the United States has been uh, tracking this type of stuff for quite some time. The very first computer emergency response team was at Carnegie Mellon University. And they have realized, even back when I was with Space Command, that this is an issue and that we needed to look at it. So the United States is probably the most mature in that respect over time. Right? So, what about uh, attribution? Oh, What's that's always wonderful, proof? right? And even Trump says attribution is difficult, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, for example, in the Shamoon attacks, they also wiped a bunch of logs and things like that. So there goes the evidence, right? And how do you prove? Because you can change your IP address, you can change your MAC address. Uh, so it, it's very difficult. Uh, they've been trying to work with uh, various technology companies to try to get telemetry data from the hardware that would then be used in the attacks to try to pinpoint things. But then again, couldn't you also change things around there again? So, yeah. Uh, ah. How has uh, the government shutdown affected U.S. readiness for a cyber attack from, like, let's say, a state actor, and how is it also affecting development in cyber defense? Well, real life example, last evening I had to change one of the slides out of national security concerns. Uh, it took me almost a week and a half to get certain information to a particular U.S. government agency, and finally I got the phone call yesterday during the day. And that was not the time for response I would have expected. So that's an issue. Yeah. Anyone else with the mic? OK, good. So uh, addressing the nation states that don't have any sort of SSL um, enabled on their websites, uh, what is the viability of using Let's Encrypt, um, which provides free and open source certificate authority that um, that, that can be used to issue SSL certificates um, as far as like security goes? Is it, is it really a viable solution for, for SSL? Uh, it could be. However, there are some countries that uh, already mandate being on the certificate chain. So for example, China has mandated that for quite some time. And they're on all the certificate chains. That's just the way it is. Australia passed legislation recently to do the same exact thing. Uh, you might have countries that purposely do not want encryption in their country so that they can surveil all the traffic. So you also have that to go against. So yes and no. Um, so you had said in a previous slide that um, when nation states are attacked by some sort of cyber nefarious organization, that they struggle to figure out the best way to respond. Is it sanctions? Is it hacking back and so on? Um, in your opinion, what would be the most appropriate way for them to respond if they're attacked by either a nation state or something that's maybe just a separate organization? Well, I mean, obviously it would uh, depend on uh, the uh, amount of damage or things like that. Uh, the night before Dead Canary, the uh, staff and I were having some drinks and we made a bet uh, to see if any of our teams would uh, consider a nuclear option. Jesus. And uh, I was telling some new friends that I met today that one of the projects I worked on with Space Command was hemp, hardening against electromagnetic pulse. So I was able to actually get my team to agree to launch a nuclear weapon and explode it in the upper atmosphere of the attacking country to end the attack. Um, so, yeah, so going a bit back to the um, Russian and Crimea situation, I remember reading that there was a bit of an incident and that soldiers were not wearing insignias and that there was no international protocol for dealing with this, as opposed to, you know, wearing the wrong insignia or whatever. But w when I read that, I immediately thought, well, 
would ha this have been born out of people knowing that they could be anonymized in the internet? And if so, would this behavior be being born out of them trying to emulate the things that are possible online in the real world? Well, uh, they might have taken their insignia off, but they sure did post a lot of photographs online and did not uh, strip the XF uh, information so you could get geolocation. Uh, the make and model of the camera, smartphone, whatever it was, uh, and uh, Facebook posts or other areas where they were doing chatting because uh, they were talking about already being there in Crimea. So they might have removed things, but they gave themselves away anyway. Brussels is notorious for moving slowly, so is DC, so this is not a pejorative question. Um, as the EU needs to get better at all this, does, does Brussels see any need to, see any urgency? Absolutely, absolutely. So the last NATO and German Marshall Fund meeting I was at was in Paris uh, May of last year and uh, under Chatham House rules, but uh, one of my uh, uh, recommendations was previous that we include uh, cyber security training as part of the 2% GDP amongst troops to try to get uh, countries capable. And they seem to be a lot more receptive in May to do that because these things need to be ramped up. And it is part of national defense for various countries. This may be outside your wheelhouse, but I'll ask it anyway. Dark money is a big problem, and dark money coming from that particular country is a real big problem. Is the EU going to do anything to address dark money? Well, we still have the problem that Luxembourg prints out 82% of the 500 euro bills, and they have direct flights to Russia. Um, they're trying, but there is also a major problem in Europe is they don't all agree on jurisdiction or to give evidence or to extradite anyone. So uh, when you want to go after someone, sometimes you can't because they're in a country you just can't get the information on. So that's a big problem, huge problem. And unfortunately, or fortunately, because they can be very good, uh, Europe instead ends up leaning a lot on the FBI to come out for major events. So uh, in the case of there was a major event in Iceland, the FBI came out the next day. Uh, major events in other countries, uh, FBI comes out and assists because of it. Ah. Um, as security practitioners, is there anything we need to be doing differently to combat these threats? Or is our usual defense and depth strategy that we wouldn't take against normal day-to-day -day stuff sufficient? Well, there are things you can do. I mean, you're here at OWASP, AppSec Cali, so you're learning about secure development and things that you can do. You're meeting people. Uh, sometimes if there are major issues that are going on or some sort of major vulnerability and you can get a hold of friends privately, a lot of things get fixed. Uh, from the, uh, was it, little man? Uh, scenario where the security researcher sent the proof of concept exploit code unencrypted. That's a bad, bad no-no. If you've got uh, critical information that you want to keep private, make sure that you have the key and you send it with that because bad people will listen. So those are some of the things. It, it's, it feels like there is a considerable um, uh, gap in industrial control system understanding and knowledge, especially at the security level. And uh, I, I only see a, a, a small number of firms that actually have that real world expertise. I, Dragos is always in the news, obviously, and stuff. And uh, is, are the, the, are the, is the EU and, and the US trying to do something to shore up their own internal security posture and train people to, to get up to speed so that we can protect our infrastructure? Uh, actually, the U.S. is uh, moving forward pretty good in this area. Uh, U.S. CERT actually changed the rules kind of recently that if you send them a proof of concept on something, uh, they now have the policy of a 45-day policy before they go public, and they can also serve as a shield. They'll contact the vendors such as Honeywell or Siemens or what have you and explain that they... This is going to become public in 45 days, so they need to do something about it. 
And because you can use them as a shield, if Siemens or Honeywell or whomever want to say, I'm going to sue you if you release this, well, who are they going to sue? You assert? No. Okay. So um, the U.S. is leading in that part. Uh, none of the other EU or U.K. certs have really a policy like that, but the U.S. does. So I know there's more questions. There's definitely one in the front. Oh, oh well, you're already on. Hi. Um, have you heard about the um, bill that got passed in Australia just before Christmas? Yes. Do you think that the um, insanely um, draconian bill like that, trying to compel companies to unencrypt things, is helpful? Or do you think it's, yeah, not? So right after they passed that legislation, I, mean, I, I just changed my pen tweet today, but uh, I had on my pen tweet um, a uh, part of the Australian uh, defense system where they were using a really weak uh, certificate on their, their email that you could, you know, uh, it, it was useless. It was like a demo. I, I, it, you just wanted to laugh. And so I think my comment was uh, this is the, the organization that uh, is saying that they need to look at everything, but they can't even secure their own stuff. So there's my comment. Do you think that the Five Eyes will um, use Australia to spy yes. on other stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All you have to do is reroute traffic. Bob's your uncle. I got all your data. I know that there was one in the front. So going back to the international response, and this may be a naive question of mine, but um, why is it that nations are waiting for the FBI to release information instead of some other sort of security agency? Well, the FBI assists in investigations, helps uh, collection of evidence, uh, helps to sort out some of the jurisdiction issues, lends their help with uh, attorneys, and tries to apply pressure in various ways to go ahead and extradite uh, or get information and proof and evidence from various countries. And they also have a lot of expertise in this area. So if you've got a major problem in a country that only has 300,000 people like Iceland, uh, then the FBI is extremely helpful. So the shutdown that's kind of currently going yes. on. It's had caused a problem. It's caused a, a big problem. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Okay. In some respects. And how much of a problem will Brexit be? It's going to be a huge problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so just after Brexit was voted in, I was also at another kind of closed conference uh, to discuss uh, the security of the European Union, both physical and digital, after Brexit, because uh, the UK is taking away the largest, most mature military from the EU. It goes away with the UK. And also, because the UK is a Five Eyes member, they can share some information with intelligence partners uh, amongst Europe when things are starting to go on. So we're going to, if we cannot come to some sort of agreement, uh, we might lose some of that intelligence information as well, which is not very good at all. So that's a huge problem. And uh, they cannot even come to an agreement on a border in Ireland. So last week there was a car bomb. So we all know IoT is a major threat. I was curious if you've done any modeling in terms of this last Christmas. It was crazy how many IoT products were sold. Yes. Uh, so in November, I presented at the EU Commission, which is kind of like the Senate in uh, Brussels, on the fragility of the North American and the European Union smart grid systems, ways to get in and out and adjust things through, uh, there's a, a program here called the Open ADR system to be able to manage uh, a lot of different types of protocols. And it can reach down into various types of smart appliances, smart plugs as well. Or you can adjust the uh, electricity cost and things of that nature. And if you can start connect and those things can be read, well, then you can manipulate them, stop them, change them, so forth. It just depends on the type of device. Um, Another good example from that presentation was I was uh, trying to show the exposure of something as simple as a burglar alarm system and uh, what you could do with that because you can really look into someone's home. And I did a, a very quick uh, survey across Europe and found that basically 88% of the exposed weak default password home alarm systems were in France alone, which pinpoints that their cert perhaps is not doing proactive scanning or looking at that problem. So 
you want a good deal when you go out Christmas shopping. You don't want to pay uh, double the price for a system that says we're super secure, because how, how much are you going to trust that anyway? So we all try to get a good deal. But does that mean that the vendor is going to have a good software development life cycle? Has that vendor sent people to a wonderful place like us? Do they have a mechanism to update? When's the last time you updated your router? Now think about if you have a smart washing machine. How often do you update that? So yes, I like IoT because I can break things. <laughs> the Western grid in the US is incredibly vulnerable. Does the EU have a similar problem? They don't do patching. They can't replace old stuff because exactly. the companies are out of business. Um, does the EU have a similar problem? Absolutely. And it's complicated because uh, the US smart grid uh, well, there, there's different parts. And Texas, of course, is Texas, so they have their own. Um, <laughs> it's just Texas. But uh, in uh, the European Union, the member states are actually physically connected to their electric grid. And what had happened, I think it was in Serbia, it was a couple of years ago, they had actually had a problem. They didn't understand or know that they were having a problem with their electricity transmission. And so they created a sump situation, two little uh, hertz going throughout the rest of Europe. And um, what had happened was over uh, the period of time that it took them to change it, it slowed down system clocks. So your microwave could not keep up time properly and things like that. So uh, it's, it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. And uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of work that's going to have to go into it to uh, make it better. I saw an another question. Um, it's very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, what is the best way to talk with a uh, like a political or otherwise a non-technical government authority? Because uh, in um, in my college, I learned about SQL injection attack, and I try to do a SQL injection attack in a local government agency, and I'm able to find all the land records of the local district, actually. And I try to call them. I try to invite. It's, nobody cared about that, actually. So I went into the office, and I told them, this is a basic SQL injection attack, yeah. which I'm able to do that. So how you are like convincing the uh, like a government organizations or like agencies, actually? Well, sometimes you can convince them. Sometimes you can't. Many times they go off of information that they can digest. What is the risk and impact if that information were to get out? And that's one of the top ways you can do it because they don't understand many times the technical stuff. So I've got the sign where I have to wrap up. Uh, I will be hanging around and I will also be here tomorrow. And I hear that there is beer soon, so I will definitely be here. So if you'd like to talk to me, I will be around. And thank you very much for attending my presentation.